Chapter Fifty Three of Peter Simple. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Shasta, Oakland, California. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter Fifty Three i am pleased with my new captain obtain leave to go home find my father afflicted with a very strange disease and prove myself a very good doctor although the disorder always breaks out in a fresh place the day after o'brien had sailed for the east indies the dockyard men came on board to survey the brig and she was found so defective as to be ordered into dock i had received letters from my sister who was overjoyed at the intelligence of my safe return and the anticipation of seeing me the accounts of my father were however very unsatisfactory my sister wrote that disappointment and anxiety had had such an effect upon him that he was deranged in his intellect our new captain came down to join us he was a very young man and never before commanded a ship his character as lieutenant was well known and not very satisfactory being that of a harsh unpleasant officer but as he had never been first lieutenant it was impossible to say what he might prove when in command of a ship still we were a little anxious about it and severely regretted the loss of o'brien he came on board the hulk to which the ship's company had been turned over and read his commission he proved to be all affability condescension and good nature to me he was particularly polite stating that he should not interfere with me in carrying out the duty as i must be so well acquainted with the ship's company we thought that those who gave us the information must have been prejudiced or mistaken in his character during the half hour that he remained on board i stated that now that the brig was in dock i should very much like to have an opportunity of seeing my friends if he would sanction my asking for leave to this he cheerfully consented adding that he would extend it upon his own responsibility my letter to the admiralty was therefore forwarded through him and was answered in the affirmative the day afterwards i set off by the coach and once more embraced my dear sister after the first congratulations were over i inquired about my father she replied that he was so wild that nobody could manage him that he was melancholy and irritable at the same time and was certainly deranged fancying himself to be made of various substances or to be in a certain trade or capacity that he generally remained in this way four or five days when he went to bed and slept for twenty-four hours or more and awoke with some new strange imagination in his head his language was violent but that in other respects he seemed to be more afraid of other people than inclined to be mischievous and that every day he was getting more strange and ridiculous he had now just risen from one of his long naps and was in his study that before he had fallen asleep he had fancied himself to be a carpenter and had sawed and chopped up several articles of furniture in the house i quitted my sister to see my father whom i found in his easy chair i was much shocked in his appearance he was thin and haggard his eyes were wild and he remained with his mouth constantly open a sick nurse 
who had been hired by my sister, was standing by him. Pish, 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 cried my father. What can you know? What can you, a stupid old woman, know about my inside? I tell you, the gas is generating fast, and even now I can hardly keep on my chair. I'm lifting, lifting now, and if you don't tie me down with cords, I shall go up like a balloon. Indeed, sir, replied the woman, it's only the wind in your stomach. You'll break it off directly. It's inflammable gas, you old hecate. I know it is. Tell me, will you get a cord or will you not? Ha! Who's that? Peter? Why, you've dropped from the clouds, just in time to see me mount up to them. I hope you feel yourself better, sir, said I. I fell myself a great deal lighter every minute. Get a cord, Peter, and tie me to the leg of the table. I tried to persuade him that he was under a mistake, but it was useless. He became excessively violent, and said I wished him in heaven, as I had heard that it was better to humor people with afflicted with hypochondriasm, which was evidently the disease under which my father labored. I tried that method. It appears to me, sir, said I, that if we could remove the gas every ten minutes, it would be a very good plan. Yes, but how, replied he, shaking his head mournfully. Why, with a syringe, sir, said I, which will, if empty, of course, draw out the gas when inserted into your mouth. My dear Peter, you have saved my life, replied my father. Be quick, though or I shall go up right through the ceiling. Fortunately, there was an instrument of that description in the house. I applied it to his mouth, drew up the piston, and then ejected the air, and reapplied it. In two minutes he pronounced himself better, and I left the old nurse hard at work, and my father very considerably pacified. I returned to my sister, to whom I recounted what had passed, but it was no source of mirth to us, although, had it happened to an indifferent person, I might have been amused. The idea of leaving her, as I must soon do, having only a fortnight's leave, to be worried by my father's unfortunate malady, was very distressing. But we entered into a long conversation in which I recounted the adventures that had taken place since I had left her, and for the time forgot our source of annoyance and regret. For three days my father insisted upon the old woman pumping the gas out of his body. After that he again fell into one of his sound sleeps, which lasted nearly thirty hours. When he arose, I went again to see him. It was eight o'clock in the evening, and I entered with a candle. Take it away, quick! Take it away! Put it out carefully! Why, what's the matter, sir? Don't come near me, if you love me. Don't come near me. Put it out, I say. Put it out. I obeyed his orders, and then asked him the reason. Reason, said he, now that we were in the dark. Can't you see? No, father, I can see nothing in the dark. Well, then, Peter, I'm a magazine full of gunpowder, the least spark in the world, and I am blown up. Consider the danger. You surely would not be the destruction of your old father, Peter. And the poor old gentleman burst into tears and wept like a child. I knew that it was in vain to reason with him. My dear father, said I, on board ship, when there is any danger of this kind, we always float the magazine. Now, if you were to drink a good deal of water, the powder would be spoiled, and there would be no danger. 
my father was satisfied with my proposal and drank a tumbler of water every half hour which the old nurse was obliged to supply as fast as he called for it and this satisfied him for three or four days and i was again left to the company of my dear ellen when my father again fell into his stupor and we wondered what would be his next fancy i was hastily summoned by the nurse and found my poor father lying in bed and breathing in a very strange manner what is the matter my dear sir inquired i why don't you see what's the matter how is the poor little infant just born to live unless its mother is near to suckle it and take care of it indeed sir do you mean to say that you are just born to be sure i do i am dying for the breast this was almost too absurd but i gravely observed that it was all very true but unfortunately his mother had died in childbirth and that the only remedy was to bring him up by hand he agreed with me i desired the nurse to make some gruel with brandy and feed him which she did and he took the gruel just as if he were a baby this fit lasted about six days for he went to sleep because a baby always slept much and i was in hopes it would last much longer but he again went off into his lethargic fit and after a long sleep awoke with a new fancy my time had nearly expired and i had written to my new captain requesting an extension of leave but i received an answer stating that it could not be granted and requesting me to join the brig immediately i was rather surprised at this but of course was compelled to obey and embracing my dear sister once more set off for portsmouth i advised her to humour my father and this advice she followed but his fancies were such occasionally as would have puzzled the most inventive genius to combat or to find a remedy which he might acknowledge to be requisite his health became certainly worse and worse and his constitution was evidently destroyed by a slow undermining bodily and mental fever the situation of my poor sister was very distressing and i must say that i quitted her with melancholy forebodings i ought here to observe that i received all my prize money amounting to one thousand five hundred and sixty pounds a large sum for a lieutenant i put it into the funds and gave a power of attorney to ellen requesting her to use it as her own we consulted as to what she should do if my father should die and agreed that all his debts which we knew to amount to three or four hundred pounds should be paid and that she should manage how she could upon what was left of my father's property and the interest of my prize money End of chapter 53chapter 54 of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by shasta oakland california peter simple by frederick marriott chapter 54 we receive our sailing orders and orders of every description a quarter-deck conversation listeners never hear any good of themselves when i arrived at portsmouth i reported myself to the captain who lived at the hotel i was ushered into his room to wait for him as he was dressing to dine with the admiral 
my eyes naturally turned to what lay on the table merely from the feeling which one has to pass away the time not from curiosity and i was much surprised to see a pile of letters the uppermost of which was franked by lord privilege this however might be merely accidental but my curiosity was excited and i lifted up the letter and found that the second the third and indeed at least ten of them were franked by my uncle i could not imagine how there could be any intimacy between him and my uncle and was reflecting upon it when captain hawkins for that was his name entered the room he was very kind and civil apologized for not being able to extend my leave which he said was because he had consulted the admiral who would not sanction the absence of the first lieutenant and had very peremptorily desired he would recall me immediately i was satisfied he shook my hand and we parted on my arrival on board the hulk for the brig was still in the dock i was warmly received by my messmates they told me that the captain had generally speaking been very civil but that occasionally the marks of the cloven hoof appeared webster said i to the second lieutenant do you know anything about his family or connections it is a question i have asked of those who have sailed with him and they all say that he never speaks of his own family but very often boasts of his intimacy with the nobility some say that he is a by-blow of some great man i reflected very much upon this and connecting it with the numerous franks of lord privilege which i saw on the table had my misgivings but then i knew that i could do my duty and had no reason to fear any man i resolved in my own mind to be very correct and put it out of the power of any one to lay hold of me and then dismissed the subject the brig was repaired and out of dock and for some days i was very busy getting her ready for sea i never quitted her in fact i had no wish I never had any taste for bad company and midnight orgies, and I had no acquaintance with the respectable portion of the inhabitants of Portsmouth. At last the ship's company were removed into the brig. We went out of the harbor and anchored at Spithead. Captain Hawkins came on board and gave me an order book, saying, Mr. Simple, i have great objection to written orders as i consider that the articles of war are quite sufficient to regulate any ship still the captain is in a very responsible situation and if any accident occurs he is held amenable i therefore have framed a few orders of my own for the interior discipline of the vessel which may probably save me harmless in case of being hauled over the coals but not with any wish that they should interfere with the comforts of the officers only to guard against any mischance of which the onus may fall upon myself i received the order book and the captain went ashore when i went down into the gun-room to look through it i at once perceived that if rigidly conformed to every officer in the ship would be rendered uncomfortable and if not conformed to i should be the party that was answerable i showed it to webster who agreed with me and gave it as his opinion that the captain's good nature and amiability were all blind and that he was intending to lay hold of us as soon as it was in his power i therefore called all the officers together and told them my opinion webster supported me and it was unanimously agreed 
that the orders should be obeyed, although not without remonstrance. The major part of the orders, however, only referred to the time that the brig was in harbor, and, as we were about to proceed to sea, it was hardly worth while saying anything at present. The orders for the sailing of the brig came down, and by the same post I received a letter from my sister Ellen, stating that they had heard from Captain Fielding, who had immediately written to Bombay, where the regiment was stationed, and had received an answer, informing him that there was no married man in the regiment of the name of Sullivan, and no woman who had followed the regiment of that name. This at once put an end to all our researches after the wet nurse who had been confined in my uncle's house. Where she had been sent, it was of course impossible to say, but I gave up all chance of discovering my uncle's treachery. And, as I thought of Celeste, sighed at the little hope I had of ever being united to her. I wrote a long letter to O'Brien, and the next day we sailed for our station in the North Sea. The captain added a night order book to the other, and sent it up every evening, to be returned in the morning, with the signature of every officer of the night watches. He also required all our signatures to his general order book, that we might not say we had not read them. I had the first watch when Swinburne came up to me. Well, Mr. Simple, I do not think we have made much by our exchange of captains, and I have a shrewd suspicion we shall have squalls ere long. We must not judge too hastily, Swinburne, replied I. No, no, I don't say that we should, but still one must go a little by looks in the world, and I'm sure his looks wouldn't help him much. He is just like a winter's day, short and dirty, and he walks the deck as if plank were not good enough for his feet. Mr. William says he looks as if he were big with the fate of Cato and of Rome. What that means I don't know. Some joke, I suppose, for the youngsters are always joking. Were you ever up in the Baltic, Mr. Simple? Now I think of it, I know you never were. I've seen some tight work up there with the gunboats, and so we should now with Captain O'Brien. But as for this little man, I have an idea twill be more talk than work. You appear to have taken a great dislike to the Captain, Swinburne. I do not know whether, as first lieutenant, I ought to listen to you. It's because you're first lieutenant that I tell it you, Mr. Simple. I never was mistaken, in the main, of an officer's character, when I could look him in the face and hear him talk for a half an hour, and I came up on purpose to put you on your guard, for I feel convinced that towards you he means mischief. What does he mean by having the greasy-faced sergeant of marines in his cabin for half an hour every morning? His reports as master of arms ought to come through you as first lieutenant, but he means him as a spy upon all, and upon you in particular. The fellow has began to give himself airs already, and speaks to the young gentlemen as if they were beneath him. I thought you might not know it, Mr. Sipple, so I thought it right to tell you. I am much obliged to you, Swinburne, for your good wishes, but I can do my duty, and why should I fear anything? A man may do his duty, Mr. Sipple, but if a captain is determined to ruin him, he has the power. I have been longer in the service than you have, and have been wide awake. Only be careful of one thing, Mr. Simple, I beg your pardon for being so free, but in no case lose your temper. No fear of that, Swinburne, replied I. It's very easy to say no fear of that, Mr. Simple, 
but recollect you have not yet had your temper tried as some officers have you have always been treated like a gentleman but should you find yourself treated otherwise you have too good blood in your veins not to speak i am sure of that i've seen officers insulted and irritated till no angel could put up with the treatment and then for an unguarded word which they would have been swabs not to have made use of sent out of the service to the devil but you forget swinburne that the articles of war are made for the captain as well as for everybody else on the ship i know that but still at court-martials captains make a great distinction between what a superior says to an inferior and what an inferior says to a superior true replied i quoting shakespeare that's in the captain but a choleric word which in the soldier is rank blasphemy exactly my meaning i rather think said swinburne if a captain calls you no gentleman you mustn't say the same to him certainly not replied i but i can demand a court-martial yes and it will be granted but what do you gain by that it's like beating against a heavy gale and a lee tide thousand to one if you fetch your port and if you do your vessel is strained to pieces sails worn as thin as a newspaper and rigging chafed half through wanting fresh serving no orders for a refit and laid up in ordinary for the rest of your life no no mr simple the best plan is to grin and bear it and keep a sharp lookout for depend upon it mr simple in the best ship's company in the world a spy captain will always find spy followers do you refer that observation to me mr spinburne said a voice from under the bulwark i started around and found the captain who had crept upon the deck unperceived by us during our conversation swinburne made no reply but touched his hat and walked over to leeward i presume mr simple said the captain turning to me that you consider yourself justified in finding fault and abusing your captain to an inferior officer on his majesty's quarter-deck if you heard the previous conversation sir replied i you must be aware that we were speaking generally about court-martials i do not imagine that i have been guilty of any impropriety in conversing with an officer upon points connected with the service you mean then to assert sir that the gunner did not refer to me when he said the words spy captain i acknowledge sir that as you were listening unperceived the term might appear to refer to you but the gunner had no idea at the time that you were listening his observation was that a spy captain would always find spy followers this i take to be a general observation and i am sorry that you think otherwise very well mr simple said captain hawkins and he walked down the companion ladder into his cabin now ain't it odd mr simple that i should come with the intention of being of service to you and yet get you into such a scrape however perhaps it is all for the best open war is preferable to watching in the dark and stabbing in the back he never meant to have shown his colors but i hit him so hard that he forgot himself i expect that to be the case swinburne but i think that you had better not talk any more with me to-night wish i hadn't talked quite so much as things have turned out replied swinburne good night sir i reflected upon what had passed and felt convinced that swinburne was right in saying that it was better that this 
had occurred than otherwise i now knew the ground which i stood upon and forewarned was being forearmed end of chapter fifty four chapter fifty five of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by anthony gurgis peter simple by frederick marriott chapter fifty five we encounter a dutch brig of war captain hawkins very contemplative near the capstan hard knocks and no thanks for it who's afraid men will talk the brig goes about on the wrong tack at daylight the next morning we were off the texel and could see the low sand hills but we had scarcely made them out when the fog in the offing cleared up and we met a strange vessel the hands were turned up and all sail made in chase we made her out to be a brig of war and as she altered her course considerably we had an idea that she was an enemy we made the private signal which was unanswered and we cleared for action the brig making all sail on the starboard track and we following her she bearing about two miles out on the weather bow the breeze was not steady at one time the brig was staggering under her top gallant sails while we had our royals set at another we would have hands by the top gallant sheets and topsail halards while she expanded every stitch of canvas on the whole however in an hour we had neared about half a mile our men were all at their quarters happy to be so soon at their old work their jackets and hats were thrown off a bandana handkerchief tied round their heads and another or else their black silk handkerchiefs tied round their waists every gun was ready everything was in its place and every soul i was going to say was anxious for the set too but i rather think i must not include the captain who from the commencement showed no signs of pleasure and anything but presence of mind when we first chased the vessel it was reported that it was a merchantman and it was not until we had broad daylight that we discovered her to be a man of war there was one thing to be said in his favour he had never been in action in his life the breeze now fell light and we were both on our sails set when the thick fog obscured her from our sight the fog rolled on until we met it and then we could not see ten yards from the brig this was a source of great mortification as we had every chance of losing her fortunately the wind was settling down fast into a calm and about twelve o'clock the sails flapped against the mast i reported twelve o'clock and asked the captain whether we should pipe to dinner not yet replied he we will put her head about go about sir replied i with surprise yes said he i am convinced that the chase is the other tack at this moment and if we do not we shall lose her if she goes about sir said i she must get among the sands and we shall be sure of her sir replied he when i ask your advice you will be pleased to give it i command this vessel i touched my hat and turned the hands up about the ship convinced that the captain wished to avoid action as the only chance of escape for the brig was her keeping her wind in the tack she was on bout ship bout ship cried the men what the hell are we going about for inquired they of one another as they came up the ladder silence therefore and aft cried i captain hawkins i do not think we can get her round unless we wear the wind is very light then wear the ship mr simple there are times when grumbling and discontent among the seamen is so participated by the officer although they do not show it that the expressions made use of are passed unheeded such was the case at the present the officers looked at each other and said nothing but the men were unguarded in their expressions the brig were gradually around and when the men were bracing up the yards sharp on the tack instead of the hurrah and the down on the mark they fell back with a groan brace up those yards in silence there said i to the men which was all i could say the ropes were coiled down and we piped to dinner the captain who continued on deck could not fail to hear the discontented expressions which occasionally were made use of on the lower deck he made no observation but occasionally looked over to the side to see whether the brig went through the water this she did slowly for about ten minutes when it fell to a perfect calm so that to use a common phrase he gained little by his motion about half-past one a slight breeze from the opposite quarter sprung up 
we turned round to it it increased the fog blew away and in a quarter of an hour the chase was again visible now upon our lee beam the men gave three cheers silence there fore and aft cried the captain angrily mr simple is this the way that the ship's company have been disciplined under their late commander to halloo and bawl whenever they think proper i was irritated at any reflection upon o'brien and i replied yes sir they have always been accustomed to express their joy at the prospect of engaging the enemy very well mr simple replied he how are we to put her head inquired the master touching his hat for the chase of course replied the captain who then descended into his cabin come my lads said swinburne as soon as the captain was below i have been going round and i find that your pets are all in good fighting order i promise ye you shan't wait for powder they'll find that the rattlesnake can bite devilish hard yet i expect ay and without its head too replied one of the men who was the joe miller of the brig the chase perceiving that she could not escape for we were coming up with her hand over hand now shortened sail for action hoistening dutch colours captain hawkins again made his appearance on the quarter deck when we were within half a mile of her are we to run alongside of her now inquired i mr simple i command her replied he and want no interference whatever very well sir replied i and i walked into the gangway mr thompson cried the captain who appeared to have screwed up his courage to the right pitch and had now taken his position for a moment on one of the carronades you will lay the brig right bang bang whiz whiz bang whiz came three shots from the enemy cleaving the air between our masts the captain jumped down from the carronade and hastened to the capstan without finishing his sentence shall we fire when we are ready sir said i for i perceive that we are not capable of giving correct orders yes yes to be sure replied he remaining where he was thompson said i to the master i think we can manage in our present commanding condition to get foul of him so as to knock away his jib boom and fore topmast and then she can't escape we have good way on her i'll manage it simple or my way is not thompson replied the master jumping into the quarter boat conning the vessel in that exposed situation as we received the enemy's fire look out my lads and pour it into her now just as you please said i to the men the seamen were however too well disciplined to take immediate advantage of my permission they waited until we were past her and just as the master put up his helm so as to catch her jib boom between our masts the whole broadside was poured into the bow and trust tree her jib boom and fore top gallant went down and she had so much way through the water that we tore clear from her and rounding to the wind shot ahead the enemy although in the confusion from the effects of our broadside put up his helm to rake us we perceived his manoeuvre and did the same and then squaring our sail we ran with him before the wind engaging broadside to broadside this continued about half an hour and we soon found out that we had no fool to play with the brig was well fought and her guns well directed we had several men taken down below and i thought it would be better to engage her even closer there was about a cable length between both vessels and we ran before the wind at about six miles an hour with a slight rolling motion thompson said i let us see if we cannot beat them from their guns let's port the helm and close her till we can shy a biscuit on board just my opinion simple we'll see if they won't make another sort of running fight of it in a few minutes we were so close on board of her that the men who loaded the guns could touch each other with their rammers and sponges the men cheered it was gallantly returned by the enemy and havoc now commenced by the musketry on both sides the french captain who appeared as a brave fellow as ever stepped stood for some minutes on the hammocks i was also holding on by the swifter of the main rigging when he took off his hat and politely saluted me i returned the compliment but the fire became too hot and i wished to get under the shelter of the bulwark still i would not go down first and the french captain appeared determined not to be the first either to quit the post of honour at last one of our marines hit him in the right arm he clasped his hand to the part as if to point out to me nodded and was assisted down from the hammocks i immediately quitted my post for i thought it foolish to stand as a mark for forty or fifty soldiers i had already received a bullet through the small of my leg but the effects of such close fire now became apparent our guns were only half manned our sides terribly cut up and our sails and rigging in tatters the enemy was even worse off and two broadsides more brought her main mast by the board our men cheered and threw in another broadside the enemy dropped astern we rounded to rake her 
She also attempted to round two, but could not unless she cleared away from her wreck and taken in her foresail and lowered her topsail. She then continued the action with as much spirit as ever. "'He's a fine fellow, by God!' exclaimed Thompson. "'I never saw a man fight a ship better, but we have him. Webster's down, poor fellow.' "'I'm sorry for it,' replied I. "'But I'm afraid there are many poor fellows who have lost a number of their mess. "'I think it useless throwing away the advantage which we now have. "'He can't escape, and he'll fight this way forever. "'We had better run ahead, repair the damages, "'and then he must surrender in his crippled state when we attack him again.' "'I agree with you,' said Thompson. "'The only point is that it will soon be dark. "'I'll not lose sight of him, and he cannot get away. "'If he puts before the wind, then we'll be at him again.' We gave him the loaded guns as we forged ahead, and when we were about half a mile from him, hove to to repair damages. The reader may now ask, but where was the captain all this time? My answer is that he was at the capstan where he stood in silence, not once interfering during the whole action which was fought by Thompson, the master, and myself. How he looked or how he behaved in other points during this engagement I cannot pretend to say, for I had no time to observe him. Even now I was busy nodding the rigging, rousing up the new sails to bend, and getting everything in order, and I should not have observed him had he not come up to me, for as soon as we had ceased firing he appeared to recover himself. He did not, however, first address me. He commenced speaking to the men. "'Come, be smart, my lad. Send a hand here to swab up the blood. Here, youngster, run down to the surgeon and let him know that I wish to report of the killed and wounded.' By degrees he talked more, and at last he came up to me. This has been rather smartish, Mr. Simple. Very smart indeed, sir, replied I, and then turned away to give directions. Main top there, send down to the hauling line, on the starboard side. Aye, aye, sir. Now then, my lads, clap on and run up on at once. Main top there, hailed the captain. Be a little smarter, or by God I'll call you down for something. This did not come with a good grace from one who had done nothing to those who were working with all their energy. Mr. Simple, said the captain, I wish you would carry on duty with less noise. At all events, he set us the example during the action, muttered the Joe Miller, and the other men laughed heartily at the implication. In two hours, during which we carefully watched the enemy who still lay where we left him, we were again ready for action. Shall I give the men their grog now, sir, said I to the captain. They must want it. No, no, replied the captain. No, no, Mr. Simple, I don't like what you call Dutch courage. I don't think he much does, and this fellow has shown plenty of it, said the Joe Miller softly, and the men about him laughed heartedly. I think, sir, observed I, that it is an injustice to the fine ship's company to hint that they're requiring Dutch courage. Dutch courage is a term for courage screwed up by drinking freely. And I most respectfully beg leave to observe that the men have not had their afternoon's allowance, and after the fatigues they have undergone really require it. I command this ship, sir, replied he. Certainly, sir, I am aware of it, rejoined I. She is now all ready for action again, and I wait your orders. The enemy is two miles on the lee quarter. The surgeon here came up with his report. Good heavens, said the captain. Forty-seven men killed and wounded. Mr. Webster dangerously. Why, the brig is crippled. We can do no more. Positively we can do no more. We can take that brig anyhow, cried one of the seamen from a dozen of the men who were to leeward, expecting orders to renew the attack. What man was that? cried the captain. No one answered. By God, this ship is a state of mutiny, Mr. Simple. We'll soon be, I think, said a voice from the crowd, which I knew very well, but the captain, having been but a short time with us, did not know it. Do you hear that, Mr. Simple? cried the captain. I regret to say that I did hear it, sir. I little thought that ever such an expression would have been make use of on board of the rattlesnake. Then fearing that he would ask me the man's name, and to pretend not to have recognized it, I said, Who was that who made use of that expression? But no one answered, and it was so dark that it was impossible to distinguish the men. After such mutinous expressions, observed the captain, I certainly will not risk His Majesty's brig under my command, as I should have wished to have done, even in her crippled stake, by again engaging the enemy. I can only regret that the officers appear as insolent as the men. Perhaps, Captain Hawkins, you will state in what, and when, I have proved myself insolent. I cannot accuse myself. 
i hope the expression was not applied to me sir said thompson the master touching his hat silence gentlemen if you please mr simple where round the ship whether the captain intended to attack the enemy or not we could not tell but we were soon undeceived for when we were round we ordered to be kept away until the dutch brig was on our lee quarter then ordering the master to shape his course for yarmouth he went down into the cabin and sent up word that i might pipe to supper and serve out the spirits the rage and indignation of the men could not be withheld after they went down to supper they gave three heavy groans in concert indeed during the whole of the night the officers who kept the watches had great difficulty in keeping the men from venting their feeling and what might almost be termed justifiable mutiny as for myself i could hardly control my vexation the brig was our certain prize and this was proved for the next day she hauled down her colours immediately to a much smaller man-of-war which fell in with her still lying in the same crippled state the captain and first lieutenant killed and nearly two-thirds of her ship's company either killed or wounded had we attacked her she would have hauled down her colours immediately for it was our last broadside which had killed the captain who had shown so much courage as first lieutenant i should have received my promotion which was now lost i cried for vexation when i thought of it as i lay in bed that his conduct was severely commented upon by the officers in the gun-room as well as by the whole ship's company i hardly need say thompson was for bringing him to a court-martial which i most gladly would have done if it only were to get rid of him but i had a long conversation with old swinburne on the subject and he proved to me that i had better not attempt it for do you see mr simple you have no proof he did not run down below he stood his ground on deck although he did nothing you can't prove cowardice then although there can be no great doubt of it again with regard to his not renewing the attack why is not a captain at liberty to decide what is best for his majesty's service and if he thought in the crippled state of the brig so close to the enemy's coast that it wasn't advisable why it could only be brought as an error of judgment then there's another thing which must be remembered mr simple which is that no captain sitting on a court-martial will if it be possible to extricate him ever prove cowardice against a brother captain because they feel that it is a disgrace to the whole cloth swinburne's advice was good and i gave up all thoughts of proceeding still it appeared to me that the captain was very much afraid that i would he was so extremely amiable and polite during our run home he said that he had watched how well i had behaved in action and would not fail to notice it this was something but he did not keep his word for his dispatch was published before we quitted the roadstead and not the name of one officer mentioned only generally saying that they conducted themselves to his satisfaction he called the enemy a corvette not specifying whether she was a brig or ship corvette and the whole was written in such a bombastic style that any one would have imagined that he had found a vessel of superior force he stated at the end that as soon as he repaired damages he wore round but that the enemy declined further action so she did certainly for the best of all possible reasons that she was too disabled to come down to us all this might have been contested but the enormous list of killed and wounded proved that we had had a hard fight and the capture of the brig afterwards that we had really overpowered her so that on the whole captain hawkins gained a great deal of credit with some although whispers were afloat which came to the ears of the admiralty and prevented him from being posted the more so as he had the modesty not to apply for it end of chapter fifty five chapter fifty six of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by anthony gurgis peter simple by frederick marriott chapter fifty six consequences of the action a ship without a fighting captain is like a thing without a head so do the sailors think a mutiny and the loss of our famous ship's company during our stay at yarmouth we were not allowed to put our foot on shore upon the plea that we must repair damages and proceed immediately to our station but the real fact was that captain hawkins was very anxious that we should not be able to talk about the action finding no charges preferred against him he recommended his system of annoyance his apartments had windows which looked out upon the brig lay at anchor 
and he constantly watched all our motions with his spy-glass noting down if i did not hoist up boats etc exactly at the hour prescribed in the book of orders so as to gather a list of charges against me if he could this we did not find out until afterwards i mentioned before that when swinburne joined us at plymouth we had recommended a figurehead being put on the brig this had been done at o'brien's expense not in the cheap way recommended by swinburne but in a very handsome manner it was a large snake coiled up in folds with its head darting out in a menacing attitude and the tail with its rattle appeared below the whole was gilded and had a very good effect but after the dockyard men had completed their repairs and the brig was painted one night the head of the rattlesnake disappeared it had been sawn off by some malicious and evil disposed persons and no traces of it were to be found i was obliged to report this to the captain who was very indignant and offered twenty pounds for the discovery of the offender but had he offered twenty thousand he never would have found out the delinquent it was however never forgotten for he understood that was implied by the manoeuvres a new head was carved but disappeared the night after it was fixed on the rage of the captain was without bounds he turned the heads up and declared that if the offender were not given up he would flog every hand on board he gave the ship's company ten minutes and then prepared to execute the threat mr paul turn the hands up for punishment said the captain in a rage and descended to his cabin for the articles of war when he was down below the officers talked over the matter to flog every man for the crime of one was the height of injustice but it was not for us to oppose him still the ship's company must have seen in our countenances that we shared their feelings the men were talking with each other in groups until they appeared to have communicated their ideas on the subject the carpenters had been slowly bringing aft the gratings left off the job the boatswain's mates who had come aft rolled the tails of the cats round the red handles and every man walked down below no one was left on the quarter-deck but the marines under arms and the officers perceiving this i desired mr paul the boatswain to send the men up the rig the gratings and the quartermasters with their seizings he came up and said that he had called them but they did not answer perceiving that the ship's company would break out into open mutiny if the captain persisted in his intention i went down into the cabin and told the captain the state of things and wished for his orders or presence on deck the captain whose wrath appeared to render him incapable of reflection immediately proceeded on deck and ordered the marines to load with ball cartridge this was done but as i was afterwards told by thompson who was standing aft the marines loaded with the powder and put the balls into their pockets they wished to keep up the character of their corpse for fidelity and at the same time not fire upon men whom they loved as brothers and with whom they coincided in opinion indeed we afterwards discovered that it was a marine who had taken off the head of the snake a second time the captain then ordered the boatswain to turn the hands up the boatswain made his appearance with his right arm in a sling what's the matter with your arm mr paul said i as he passed by me tumble down the hatchway just now can't move my arm i must go to the surgeon as soon as this is over the hands were piped up again but no one obeyed the order thus was the brig in a state of mutiny mr simple go forward to the main hatchway with the marines and fire on the lower deck cried the captain sir said i there are two frigates within the cable's length of us and would it not be better to send for assistance without shedding blood besides sir you have not yet tried the effect of calling up the carpenters and boatswain's mates by name will you allow me to go down first and bring them to a sense to their duty yes sir i presume you know your power but of this hereafter i went down below and called the men by name sir said one of the boatswain's mate the ship's company say that they will not submit to be flogged i do not speak to the ship's company generally collins replied i but you are now ordered to rig the gratings and come on deck it is an order that you cannot refuse go up directly and obey it quartermasters go on deck with your seizings when all is ready you can then expulsuate the men obeyed my orders they crawled on deck rigged the gratings and stood by all is ready sir said i touching my hat to the captain send the ship's company aft mr paul aft then all of you for punishment cried the boatswain yes it is all of us for punishment cried one voice we've all to flog one another and then pay off the jollies 
Note, jollies is a slang word for marines. This time the men obeyed the order. They all appeared on the quarter deck. The men are all aft, sir, reported the boatswain. And now, my lads, cried the captain, I'll teach you what mutiny is. You see these two frigates alongside us? You had forgotten them, I suppose, but I hadn't. Here, you scoundrel, Mr. Jones, this was the Joe Miller, strip, sir, if ever there was mischief on the ship, you are at the head. Head, sir, said the man, assuming a vacant look. What head, sir? Do you mean the snake's head? I don't know anything about it, sir. Strip, sir, cried the captain in a rage. I'll soon bring you to your senses. If you please, your honor, what have I done to be tied up, said the man. Strip, you scoundrel. Well, sir, if you please, it's hard to be flogged for nothing. The man pulled off his clothes and walked up to the grating. The quartermaster seized him up. Seized up, sir, reported the scoundrel of a sergeant of marines who acted as the captain's spy. The captain looked for the articles of war to read as is necessary previous to punishing a man, and was a little puzzled to find one, where no positive offense had been committed. At last he pitched upon one which refers to combination and conspiracy, and creating discontent. We all took off our hats as he read it, and then he called Mr. Paul the boatswain, and ordered him to give the man a dozen. Please, sir, said the boatswain, pointing to his arm in a sling, I can't flog, I can't lift up my arm. Your arm was well enough when I came on board, sir, cried the captain. Yes, sir, but in hurrying the men, I slipped down the ladder, and I'm afraid I've put my shoulder out. The captain bit his lips. He fully believed it was a sham on the part of the boatswain, which indeed it was, to get off flogging the men. Well, then, where's the chief boatswain's mate, Colin? Here, sir, said Collins, coming forward, a stout muscular man nearly six feet high with a pigtail nearly four feet long, and his open breast covered with shaggy hair. Give that man a dozen, sir, said the captain. The man looked at the captain and the ship's company, and then the man seized up, but did not commence the punishment. Do you hear me? roared the captain. If you please, your honor, I'd rather take my disrating. I don't wish to be chief boatswain's mate in this here business. Obey your orders immediately, sir, cried the captain, or by God I'll try you for mutiny. Well, sir, I beg your pardon, but what must be must be. I mean no disrespect, Captain Hawkins, but I cannot flog that man. My conscience won't let me. Your conscience, sir. Beg your pardon, Captain Hawkins. I've always done my duty, foul weather or fair, and I've been eighteen years in His Majesty's service without ever being brought to punishment but if i am to be hung now saving your pleasure with all respect i can't help it i'll give you but one moment more sir cried the captain do your duty the man looked at the captain and then eyed the yardarm captain hawkins i will do my duty although i must swing for it so saying he threw his cat down on the quarter deck and fell back among the ship's company the captain was now confounded and hardly knew how to act to persevere appeared useless. To fall back was almost as impossible. A dead silence of a minute ensued. Everyone was breathless with impatience to know what would be done next. The silence was, however, first broken by Jones, the Joe Miller, who was seized up. "'Beg your honour's pardon, sir,' said he, turning his head round. "'But if I'm to be flogged, would you please to let me have it over? I shall catch my death a-cold naked here all day.' This was decided mockery on the part of the man, and roused the captain. Sergeant of Marines, put Jones and that man Collins both legs in irons for mutiny. My men, I perceive that there is a conspiracy in the ship, but I shall very soon put an end to it. I know the men, and by God they shall repent it. Mr. Paul, pipe down. Mr. Simple, man my gig, and recollect, it's my positive order that no boat goes on shore. The captain left the brig, looking daggers at me as he went over the side, but I had done my duty and cared little for that. Indeed, I was now watching his conduct as carefully as he did mine. The captain wishes to tell his own story first, said Thompson, coming up to me. Now, if I were you, Simple, I would take care that the real facts should be known. How's that to be done? replied I. He has ordered no communication with the shore. Simply by sending an officer on board of each of the frigates to state that the brig is in a state of mutiny and request that they will keep a lookout upon her. This is no more than your duty as commanding officer. You only send the message. Leave me to state the facts of my own accord. Recollect that the captains of these frigates will be summoned if there is a court of inquiry which I expect will take place. 
I considered a little and thought the advice was good. I dispatched Thompson first to one frigate and then to the other. The next day the captain came on board. As soon as he stepped on the quarter deck, he inquired how I dared disobey his orders in sending the boats away. My reply was that his orders were not to communicate with the shore, but that as commanding officer I considered it my duty to make known to the other ships that the men were in a state of insubordination, that they might keep their eyes upon us. He kept his eyes upon me for some time, and then turned away without reply. As we expected, a court of inquiry was called upon his representations to the admiral. About twenty of the men were examined, but so much came out as to the reason why the head of the snake had been removed, for the sailors spoke boldly that the admiral and officers who were appointed strongly recommended Captain Hoggins not to proceed further than to state that there were some disaffected characters in the ship, and move the admiral to have them exchanged into others. This was done. The captains in the frigates, who immediately gave their advice, divided all our best men between them. They spoke very freely to me and asked me who were the best men, which I told them honestly, for I was glad to be able to get them out of the power of Captain Hawkins. These they marked as disaffected and exchanged them for the worst they had on board. The few that were left ran away, and thus, from having one of the finest and best organized ship's company in the service, we were now one of the very worst. Jones was sent on board of the frigate and under surveillance. He soon proved that his character was as good as I stated it to be, and two years afterwards was promoted to the rank of boatswain. I must here remark that there is hardly any degree of severity which a captain may not exert towards his seamen, provided they are confident of, or he has proved to them his courage. But if there be a doubt or a confirmation to the contrary, all discipline is destroyed by contempt, and the ship's company mutiny, either directly or indirectly. There is an old saying that all tyrants are cowards, that tyranny is in itself a species of meanness. I acknowledge, but still the saying ought to be modified. If it is asserted that all mean tyrants are cowards, I agree, but I have known in the service of most special tyrants who were not cowards. Their tyranny was excessive, but there was no meanness in their dispositions. On the contrary, they were generous, open-hearted, and occasionally, when not influenced by anger, proved that their hearts, if not quite right, were not very much out of their places. Yet they were tyrants, but although tyrants, the men forgave them, and one kind act when they were not led away by the impetuously of their feelings, obliterated a hundred acts of tyranny. But such is not the case in our service with men who, in their tyranny, are mean. The seamen show no quarter to them, and will undergo all the risk which the severity of the articles of war render them liable to. Rather than not express their opinions of men whom they despise, I do not like to mention names, but I could point out specimens of brave tyrants and of cowardly tyrants who have existed, and do even now exist in our service. The present regulations have limited tyranny to a certain degree, but it cannot check the mean tyrant, for it is not in points of consequence likely to be brought before the notice of his superiors that he effects his purpose. He resorts to paltry measures. He smiles that he may betray. He confines himself within the limit that may protect him, and he is never exposed unless by his courage being called in question, which but rarely occurs, and when it does occur, it is most difficult as well as most dangerous to attempt to prove it. It may be asked why I did not quit the ship after having been aware of the character of the captain and the enmity which he bore to me. In reply, I can only say that I did often think of it, talking over the subject with my messmates, but they persuaded me to remain, and as I was a first lieutenant and knew that any successful action would, in all probability, ensure my promotion, I determined to use a nautical expression to rough it out, and not throw away the only chance which I now had of obtaining my rank as commander. End of chapter 56「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Gerges. Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott. Chapter 57. News from home not very agreeable, although the reader may laugh. We arrive at Portsmouth, where I fall in with my old acquaintance, Mrs. Trotter. We sail with a convoy for the Baltic. 
I had written to my sister Ellen, giving her an account of all that had passed, and mentioning the character of the captain and his apparent intimacy with my uncle. I received an answer from her telling me that she had discovered from a very communicative old maiden lady that Captain Hawkins was an illegitimate son of my uncle, by a lady with whom he had been acquainted about the time that he was in the army. I immediately conceived the truth that my uncle had pointed out to him as an object of his vengeance, and that Captain Hawkins was too dutiful and too dependent a son not to obey him. The state of my father was more distressing than ever, but there was something very ludicrous in his fancies. He had fancied himself a jackass, and had brayed for a week, kicking the old nurse in the stomach, so as to double her up like a hedgehog. He had taken it into his head that he was a pump, and with one arm held out as a spout, he had obliged the poor old nurse to work the other up and down for hours together. In fact, there was a string of strange conceptions of this kind that had accumulated, so as to drive my poor sister almost mad, and sometimes his ideas would be attended with a very heavy expense, and he would send for architects, make contracts, etc., for building, supposing himself to have come to the title and property of his brother. This being the basis of his disease occurred frequently. I wrote to poor Ellen, giving her my best advice, and by this time the brig was again ready for sea, and we expected to sail immediately. I did not forget to write to O'Brien, but the distance between us was so great that I knew I could not obtain his answer probably for a year, and I felt a melancholy foreboding how much I required his advice. Our orders were to proceed to Portsmouth and join a convoy collected there bound up the Baltic under the charge of the Acasta Frigate and two other vessels. We did not sail with any pleasure or hopes of gaining much in the way of prize money. Our captain was enough to make any ship a hell, and our ship's company were composed of a mutinous and incorrigible set of scoundrels with, of course, a few exceptions. How different did the officers find the brig after losing such a captain as O'Brien and so fine a ship's company? But there was no help for it, and all we could do was to make the best of it and hope for better times. The cat was at work nearly every day, and I must acknowledge that generally speaking it was deserved although sometimes a report from the sergeant of marines of any good man favored by me was certain to be attended to. This system of receiving reports directly from an inferior officer instead of through me as first lieutenant became so annoying that I resolved at all risks to expostulate. I soon had an opportunity, for one morning the captain said to me, Mr. Simple, I understand that you had a fire in the gallery last night after hours. It's very true, sir, that I did order a stove to be lighted, but may I inquire whether the first lieutenant has not a discretionary power at that point? And further, how is it that I am reported to you by other people? The discipline of this ship is carried on by me under your directions, and all reports ought to come through me, and I cannot understand upon what grounds you permit them through any other channel." I command my own ship, sir, and shall do as I please in that respect. When I have officers I can confide in, I shall, in all probability, allow them to report to me. If there is anything in my conduct which has proved to you that I am incapable or not trustworthy, I would feel obliged to you, sir, if you would, in the first place, point it out, and in the next, bring me to a court-martial if I do not direct it. I am no court-martial man, sir, replied he, but I am not to be dictated to by an inferior officer, so you oblige me by holding your tongue. The sergeant of marines as master at arms is bound to report to me any deviation from the regulations I have laid down for the discipline of the ship. Granted, sir, but that report, according to the custom of the service, should come through the first lieutenant. I prefer it coming direct, sir. It stands less chance of being garbled. Thank you, Captain Hawkins, for the compliment. The captain walked away without further reply, and shortly after went down below. Swinburne ranged up alongside of me as soon as the captain disappeared. Well, Mr. Simple, so I hear we are bound to the Baltic. Why couldn't they have ordered us to pick off the convoy off Yartmouth, instead of coming all the way to Portsmouth? We shall be in tomorrow with this slant of wind. I suppose the convoy are not yet collected, Swinburne, and you recollect there's no want of French privateers in the channel. Very true, sir. When were you up in the Baltic, Swinburne? I was in the old St. George, a regular old 98. She sailed just like a haystack, one mile ahead and three to leeward. Lord bless you, Mr. Simple, the Cadigat wasn't wide enough for her, but she was a comfortable sort of vessel after all, expecting on a lee shore, so we used always to give the land a wide berth, I recollect. By the by, Mr. Simple, do you recollect how angry you were because I did peach at Barbados when the man sucked the monkey? To be sure I do. Well, then, I didn't think it fair, then, as I was one of them, but now that I'm a bit of an officer, I'll just tell you when we get to Calcelona. There's a method of sucking the monkey there, 
which as first lieutenant with such a queer sort of captain it is just as well as you should be up to in the old st george we had seventy men drunk one afternoon and the first lieutenant couldn't find out no how indeed swinburne you must let me into that secret so i will mr simple don't you know there's a famous stuff for cuts and wounds called balsam what rig a balsam yes that's it well all the boats will bring that for sale and they did to us in the old st george devilish good stuff it is for wounds i believe but it's not bad to drink and it's very strong we used to take it inwardly mr simple and the first lieutenant never guessed it what you all got tipsy upon rig about sam all that i could so as to give you a hint i'm much obliged to you swinburne i certainly never should have suspected it i believe seamen would get drunk upon anything the next morning we anchored at spithead and found the convoy ready for sea the captain went on shore to report himself to the admiral and as usual the brig was surrounded with bumboats and wherries with people who wished to come aboard and we were not known on the portsmouth station and had no acquaintance with the people all the bumboats were very anxious to supply the ship and as this is the option of the first lieutenant he is very much persecuted until he has made his decision certificates of good conduct from the other officers were handed up the side from all of them and i looked over the books of the capstan in the second book the name struck me it was that of mrs trotter and i walked to the gangway out of curiosity to ascertain whether it was the same personage who when i was a youngster had taken care of my shirts as i looked at the boats a voice cried out oh mr simple have you forgot your old friend don't you recollect mrs trotter i certainly did not recollect her she had grown very fat and although more advanced in years was a better looking woman than when i had first seen her for she looked healthy and fresh indeed i hardly did recollect you mrs trotter i have had so much to tell you mr simple replied she ordering the boat to pull alongside and as she was coming up desired the man to get the things in as if permission was quite unnecessary i did not counter order it as i knew none of the others and as far as honesty was concerned believed them all to be much on par on the strength then of old acquaintance mrs trotter was admitted well i'm sure mr simple cried mrs trotter out of breath with climbing up the brick side what a man you've grown and such a handsome man too dear dear it makes me feel quite old to look at you when i call to mind the little boy i had charge of in the cockpit don't you think i look very old and ugly mr simple continued she smiling and smirking indeed mrs trotter i think you wear very well pray how is your husband ah mr simple poor dear mr trotter he's gone poor fellow no what with his drinking and his love for me and his jealousy do you recollect how jealous he was mr simple he wore himself out at last no wonder considering that he had been accustomed to after keeping his carriage and dogs with everybody to be reduced to see his wife go a bumming it broke his heart poor fellow and mr simple i've been much happier ever since for i could not bear to see him fretting lord how jealous he was and all about nothing don't you want some fresh meat for the gun-room i've a nice leg of mutton in the boat and some milk for tea recollect mrs trotter i shall not overlook you bringing spirits on board lord mr simple how could you think of such a thing it's very true that these very common people do it but the company i have felt the society i have been in mr simple besides you must recollect that i never drink anything but water i could not exactly coincide with her but i did not contradict her would you like the portsmouth paper mr simple taking one out of her pocket i know gentlemen are very fond of the news poor trotter used to never stir from the breakfast table until he had finished the daily paper but that was when we lived in a very different style have you any clothes to wash mr simple or have any of the gentlemen i fear we have no time for we shall sail soon replied i we go with the convoy indeed cried mrs trotter who walked to the main hatchway and called to her man bill i heard her give him directions to sell nothing upon trust in consequence of the intelligence of our immediate sailing i beg your pardon mr simple i was only desiring my head man to be sent for your steward that he might be supplied with the best and to save some milk for the gun-room and i must beg your pardon mrs trotter for i must attend to my duty mrs trotter made her curtsy and walked down the main ladder to attend to her duty and we separated i was informed she had a great deal of custom as she understood how to manage the officers and made herself generally useful to them she had been a bumboat woman for six years and she had made a great deal of money indeed it was reported that if a first lieutenant wanted forty or fifty pounds mrs trotter would always lend it to him without requiring his promissory note 
The captain came on board in the evening, having dined with the admiral, and left directions for having all ready for unmooring and heaving short at daylight. The signal was made from the frigate at sunrise, and before twelve o'clock we were all under way and running past St. Helen with a favorable wind. Our force consisted of the Acasta frigate, the Isis ship, sloop, mounting twenty guns, the reindeer, eighteen, and our own brig. The convoy amounted to nearly two hundred. Although the wind was fair and the water smooth, we were more than a week before we had made and hold light, owing to the bad sailing and inattention of many of the vessels belonging to the convoy. We were constantly employed, repeating signals, firing guns, and often sent to tow up the sternmost vessels. At last we passed the Anholt light with a light breeze, and the next morning the mainland was to be distinguished on both bows. End of chapter 57 Chapter 58 of Peter Simple This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott Chapter 58 How We Passed the Sound and What Passed in the Sound The captain overhears again a conversation between Swinburne and me. I was on the signal chest abaft counting the convoy when Swinburne came up to me. Have you been here before with a convoy, Swinburne? To be sure I have. And it's sharp work that I've seen here, Mr. Simple. Work that I have an idea a captain won't have much stomach for. Swinburne, I beg you will keep your thoughts relative to the captain to yourself. Recollect the last time. It is my duty not to listen to them. And I should rather think to report them also, Mr. Simple, said Captain Hawkins, who had crept up to us and overheard our conversation. In this instance, there is no occasion for my reporting them, sir, replied I, for you have heard what has passed. I have, sir, replied he, and I shall not forget the conversation. I turned forward. Swinburne had made his retreat the moment that he heard the voice of the captain. How many sails are there in sight, sir? inquired the captain. One hundred and sixty-three, sir, I replied. Signal to convoy to close from Acasta, reported the midshipman of the watch. We repeated it, and the captain descended to his cabin. We were then running about four miles an hour, the water very smooth, and Anhold Lighthouse hardly visible on deck, bearing north-northwest about twenty miles. In fact, we were near the entrance of the sound, which the reader may be aware is a narrow passage leading into the baltic sea my watch was nearly out when the midshipman who was looking round with his glass on the copenhagen side reported three gunboats sweeping out from behind a point i examined them and went down to report them to the captain when i came on deck more were reported until we counted ten two of them large vessels called prams the captain now came on deck, and I reported them. We made the signal of enemy in sight to the Acasta, which was answered. They divided, six of them pulling along shore towards the convoy in the rear, and four coming out right for the brig. The Acasta now made the signal for boats manned and armed to be held in readiness. We hoisted out our pinnace and lowered down our cutters, the other men of war doing the same. In about a quarter of an hour the gunboats opened their fire with their long thirty-two pounders, and their first shot went right through the hull of the brig, just aft the forebits. Fortunately no one was hurt. I turned round to look at the captain. He was as white as a sheet. He caught my eye and turned aft. When he was met by Swinburne's eye steadily fixed upon him, he then walked to the other side of the deck another shot ploughed up the water close to us rose and came through the hammock netting tearing out two of the hammocks and throwing them on the quarter-deck when the acasta hoisted out pennants and made the signal to send our pinnace and cutter to the assistance of vessels astern the signal was also made to the isis and reindeer i reported the signal and inquired who was to take the command you mr semple will take the pinnace and order mr swinburne into the cutter mr swinburne sir replied i the brig will in all probability be in action soon and his services as a gunner will be required 
well then mr hilton may go beat to quarters where is mr webster the second lieutenant was close to us and he was ordered to take the duty during my absence i jumped into the pinnace and shoved off ten other boats from the acasta and the other men of war were pulling in the same direction and i joined them the gunboats had now opened fire upon the convoy astern and were sweeping out to capture them dividing themselves into two parties and pulling towards different portions of the convoy in half an hour we were within gunshot of the nearest which directed its fire at us but the lieutenant of the acasta who commanded the detachment ordered us to lie on our oars for a minute while he divided his force in three divisions of four boats each with instructions that we should each oppose a division of two gunboats this was well arranged i had the command of one division for the first lieutenants had not been sent away from the isis and reindeer and having inquired which of the divisions of gunboats i was to oppose i pulled for them in the meantime we observed that the two prams and two gunboats which had remained behind us and had been firing at the racehorse had also divided one pram attacking the acasta the two gunboats playing upon the isis and the other pram engaging the rattlesnake and reindeer the latter vessel being in a line with us and about a half a mile farther out so that she could not return any effectual fire or indeed receive much damage one of the prams mounted ten guns and the other eight the last was opposed to the rattlesnake and the fire was kept up very smartly particularly by the acasta and the enemy in about a quarter of an hour i arrived with my division close to the vessel which was the nearest to the enemy it was a large sutherland built ship the gunboats which were within a quarter of a mile of her sweeping to her as fast as they could as soon as they perceived our approach directed their fire upon us but without success except the last discharge in which we being near enough they had loaded with grape the shot fell a little short but one piece of grape struck one of the bowmen of the pinnace taking off three fingers of his right hand as he was pulling his oar before they could fire again we were sheltered by the vessel pulling close to her side hid from the enemy this continued for some time the enemy not advancing nearer but firing into the sutherland ship which protected us at last the master of the ship looked over the side and said to me i say my joker do you call this giving me assistance i think i was better off before you came then i had only my share of the enemy's fire but now that you have come i have it all i'm riddled like a sieve and have lost four men already suppose you give me a spell now pull behind the vessel ahead of us i'll take my chance i pulled up to the other vessel a large brig and the captain as soon as we came alongside said i see what you're about and i'll just leave you my vessel to take care of no use losing my men and being knocked on the head all's right you can't do better and we can't do better either his boat was lowered down and getting in with his men he pulled to another vessel and lay behind it all ready to pull back if a breeze sprang up as was to be expected the gunboats shifted their fire to the deserted vessel which the boats lay behind and thus did the action of our quarter continue until it was dark the gunboats not choosing to advance and was restricted from pulling out to attack them but i soon perceived that the gunboats were nearing us every time that they fired and i now discharged grape alone waiting for the flash of the fire to ascertain their direction at last i could perceive their long low hulls not two cables lengths from us and their sweeps lifting from the water it was plain that they were advancing to board and i resolved to anticipate them if possible i had fired ahead of the brig and i now pulled with all my boats astern giving my orders to the officers and laying on our oars in readiness the gunboats were about half a cable's length from each other pulling up abreast and passing us at about the same distance when i directed the men to give way i had determined to throw all my force upon the nearest boat and in half a minute our bows were forced between their sweeps which we caught hold of to force our way alongside the resistance of the danes was very determined three times did i obtain a footing on the deck 
and three times i was thrown back into the boats at last we had fairly obtained our ground and were driving them gradually forward when as i ran onto the gunwale to obtain a position more in advance of my men i received a blow with the butt end of a musket i believe on the shoulder which knocked me overboard and i fell between the sweeps and sank under the vessel's bottom i rose under the stern but i was so shook with the violence of the blow that i was for some time confused still i had strength to keep myself above water and paddled as it appeared away from the vessel until i hit against a sweep which had fallen overboard this supported me and i gradually recovered myself a light breeze rippled the water and i knew that i had no time to lose in about five minutes i heard the sound of oars and perceived a boat crossing me i hailed as loud as i could they heard me laid on their oars and i hailed again they pulled to me and took me in it was the master of the brig who aware of the capture of one gunboat and the retreat of the other was looking for his vessel or as he told me for what was left of her in a short time we found her and although very much cut up she had received no shot under water here i may as well relate the events of the action one of the other divisions of gunboats had retreated when attacked by the boats the other had beaten off the boats and killed many of the men but had suffered so much themselves as to retreat without making any capture the acasta lost four men killed and seven wounded the isis three men wounded the reindeer had nobody hurt the rattlesnake had six men killed and two wounded including the captain but of that i shall speak hereafter i found that i was by no means seriously hurt by the blow i had received my shoulder was stiff for a week and very much discoloured but nothing more when i fell overboard i had struck against a sweep which had cut my ear half off the captain of the brig gave me dry clothes and in a few hours i was very comfortably asleep hoping to join my ship the next day but in this i was disappointed the breeze was favourable and fresh but we were clear of the sound but a long way astern of the convoy none of the headmost men of war to be seen i dressed and went on deck and immediately perceived that i had little chance of joining my ship until we arrived at karlskrona which proved to be the case about ten o'clock the wind died away and we had from that time such baffling light winds that it was six days before we dropped our anchor every vessel of the convoy having arrived before us end of chapter fifty eight recording by john brandon chapter fifty nine of peter simple this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon peter simple by frederick marriott chapter fifty nine the dead man attends at the auction of his own effects and bids the sale to stop one more than was wanted peter steps into his own shoes again captain hawkins takes a friendly interest in peter's papers riga balsam sternly refused to be admitted for the relief of the ship's company as soon as the sails were furled i thanked the master of the vessel for his kindness and requested the boat he ordered it to be manned saying how glad your captain will be to see you i doubted that we shook hands and i pulled to the rattlesnake which lay about two cables length the stern of us i had put on a jacket when i left the brig on service and coming in a merchantman's boat no attention was paid to me indeed owing to circumstances no one was on the lookout and i ascended the side unperceived the men and officers were on the quarter-deck attending the sale of dead men's effects before the mast and every eye was fixed upon six pairs of nankin trousers exposed by the purser's steward which i recognized as my own nine shillings 
for six pairs of nankin trousers cried the purser's steward come on men they're worth more than that observed the captain who appeared to be very facetious it's better to be in his trousers than in his shoes this brutal remark created a silence for a moment well then steward let them go one would think that pulling on his trousers would make you as afraid as he was continued the captain laughing shame was cried out by one or two of the officers and i recognized swinburne's voice as one more likely if they put on yours cried i in a loud indignant tone everybody started and turned around captain hawkins staggered to a coronade i beg to report myself as having rejoined my ship sir continued i hurrah my lads three cheers for mr simple said swinburne the men gave them with emphasis the captain looked at me and without saying a word hastily retreated to his cabin i perceived as he went down that he had his arm in a sling i thanked the men for their kind feeling towards me shook hands with thompson and webster who warmly congratulated me and then with old swinburne who nearly wrung my arm off and gave my shoulder such pain as to make me cry out and with the others who extended theirs i desired the sale of my effects to be stopped fortunately for me it had just begun and the articles were all returned thompson had informed the captain that he knew my father's address and would take charge of my clothes and send them home but the captain would not allow him in a few minutes i received a letter from the captain desiring me to acquaint him in writing for the information of the senior officer in what manner i had escaped i went down below when i found one very melancholy face that of the past midshipman of the acasta who had received an acting order in my place when i went to my desk i found two important articles missing one my private letter-book and the other the journal which i kept of what passed and from which this narrative has been compiled i inquired of my messmates who stated that the desk had not been looked into by any one but the captain who of course must have possessed himself of those important documents i wrote a letter containing a short narrative of what had happened and at the same time another on service to the captain requesting that he would deliver up my property the private journal and letter book in his possession the captain as soon as he received my letters sent up word for his boat to be manned as soon as it was manned i reported it and then begged to know whether he intended to comply with my request he answered that he should not and then went on deck and quitted the brig to pull on board of the senior officer i therefore determined immediately to write to the captain of the acasta acquainting him with the conduct of captain hawkins and requesting his interference this i did immediately and the boat that had brought me on board not having left the brig i sent the letter by it requesting them to put it into the hands of one of the officers the letter was received previous to captain hawkins's visit being over and the captain of the acasta put it into his hands inquiring if the statement were correct captain hawkins replied that it was true that he had detained these papers as there was so much mutiny and disaffection in them that he should not return them to me that i cannot permit replied the captain of the acasta who was aware of the character of captain hawkins if by mistake you have been put in possession of any of mr simple's secrets you are bound in honour not to make use of them neither can you retain property not your own but captain hawkins was determined and refused to give them to me well then captain hawkins replied the captain of the acasta you will oblige me by remaining on my quarter-deck till i come out of the cabin the captain of the acasta then wrote an order directing captain hawkins immediately to deliver up to him the papers of mine in his possession and coming out of the cabin put it into captain hawkins hands saying now sir here is a written order from your superior officer disobey it if you dare if you do i will put you under an arrest and try you by a court-martial 
captain hawkins bit his lip at the order your boat is manned sir said the captain of the acasta in a severe tone captain hawkins came on board sealed up the books and sent them to the captain of the acasta who redirected them to me on his majesty's service and returned them by the same boat the public may therefore thank the captain of the acasta for the memoirs which they are now reading from my messmates i gained the following intelligence of what had passed after i quitted the brig the fire of the pram had cut them up severely and captain hawkins had been struck in the arm with a piece of the hammock rail which had been shot away shortly after i left although the skin only was raised he thought proper to consider himself badly wounded and giving up the command to mr webster the second lieutenant had retreated below where he remained until the action was over when mr webster reported the return of the boats with the capture of the gunboat and my supposed death he was delighted that he quite forgot his wound and ran on deck rubbing his hands as he walked up and down at last he recollected himself went down into his cabin and came up again with his arm in a sling during the short time that we remained in port i took care that riga balsam should not be allowed to come alongside and the men were all sober we received orders from the captain of the acasta to join the admiral who was off the texel in pursuance of directions he had received from the admiralty to dispatch one of the squadron and we were selected from the dislike which he had taken to captain hawkins End of chapter 59 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 60 of Peter Simple This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon Peter Simple by Frederick Marriott Chapter 60 An Old Friend in a New Case heart of oak in swedish fir a man's a man all the world over and something more in many parts of it peter gets reprimanded for being dilatory but proves a title to a defence allowed when we were about forty miles off the harbour a frigate hove in sight we made the private signal she hoisted swedish colours and kept away a couple of points to close with us we were within two miles of her when she up courses and took in her tea-gallant sails as we closed to within two cable lengths she hove to we did the same and the captain desired to lower down the boat and board her ask her name by whom she was commanded and offer any assistance if the captain required it this was the usual custom of the service and i went on board in obedience to my orders when i arrived on the quarter-deck i asked in french whether there were any one who spoke it the first lieutenant came forward and took off his hat i stated that i was requested to ask the name of the vessel and the commanding officer to insert it in our log and to offer any services that we could command he replied that the captain was on deck and turned around but the captain had gone down below i will inform him of your message i had no idea that he had quitted the deck and the first lieutenant left me i exchanged a few compliments and a little news with the officers on deck who appeared to be very gentlemanlike fellows when the first lieutenant requested my presence in the cabin i descended the door was opened i was announced by the first lieutenant and he quitted the cabin i looked at the captain who was sitting at the table he was a fine stout man with two or three ribbons at his buttonhole and a large pair of mustachios i thought that i had seen him before but i could not recollect when his face was certainly familiar to me but as i had been informed by the officers on deck that the captain was a count shuckson a person i had never heard of i thought that i must be mistaken i therefore addressed him in french paying him a little compliment with all the necessary etc the captain turned round to me took his hand away from his forehead which it had shaded and looked me full in the face replied 
mr semple i don't understand but very little french spin your yarn in plain english i started i thought that i knew your face replied i am i mistaken no it must be mr chucks you are right my dear mr semple it is your old friend chucks the boatswain whom you now see we shook hands heartily and then he requested me to sit down what said i they told me on deck that the frigate was commanded by count shuckson that is my present rank my dear peter but as you have no time to lose i will explain all i know i can trust to your honour you remember that you left me as you and i supposed dying in the privateer with the captain's jacket and epaulets on my shoulders when the boats came out and you left the vessel they boarded and found me i was still breathing and judging of the rank by my coat they put me into the boat and pushed on shore the privateer sank very shortly after i was not expected to live but in a few days a change took place and i was better they asked me my name and i gave my own which they lengthened to shuckson somehow or another i recovered by a miracle and am now as well as ever i was in my life they were not a little proud of having captured a captain of the british service as they supposed for they never questioned me as to my real rank after some weeks i was sent home to denmark in a running vessel but it so happened that we met with a gale and were wrecked on the swedish coast close to karlskrona the danes were at that time at war having joined the russians and they were made prisoners while i was of course liberated and treated with great distinction but as i could not speak either french or their own language i could not get on very well however i had a handsome allowance and permission to go to england as soon as i pleased the swedes were then at war with the russians and were fitting out their fleet but god bless them they didn't know much about it at last they all came to me and if they did not understand me entirely i showed them how to do it with my own hands and the fleet began to make a show of their rigging the admiral who commanded was very much obliged and i seemed to come as regularly to my work as if i were paid for it at last the admiral came with an english interpreter and asked me whether i was anxious to go back to england or would i like to join their service i saw what they wanted and i replied that i would prefer an english frigate to a swedish one and that i would not consent unless they offered something more and then with the express stipulation that i should not take arms against my own country they then waited for a week when they offered to make me a count and give me the command of the frigate this suited me as you may suppose peter it was the darling wish of my heart i was to be made a gentleman i consented and was made count shuckson and had a fine large frigate under my command i then set to work with a will superintended the fitting out of the whole fleet and showed them what an englishman could do we sailed and you of course know the brush we had with the russians which i must say did us no discredit i was fortunate to distinguish myself for i exchanged several broadsides with a russian two-decked ship and came off with honour when we went into port i got this ribboned i was out afterwards and fell in with a russian frigate and captured her for which i received this other ribbon since that i have been in high favour and now that i speak the languages i like the people very much i am often at court when i am in harbour and peter i am married i wish you joy count with all my heart yes and well married too to a swedish countess of very high family and i expect that i have little boy or girl by this time so you observe peter that i am at last a gentleman and what is more my children will be noble by two descents who would have thought 
that this would have been occasioned by my throwing the captain's jacket into the boat instead of my own and now my dear mr simple that i have made you my confidant i need not say do not say a word about it to anybody my dear count replied i your secret is safe with me and my pleasure is very great i then in a few words stated where o'brien was and then we parted i went with him on deck count shuxton taking my arm and introducing me as an old shipmate to his officers i hope we may meet again said i but i'm afraid there is little chance who knows replied he see what chance has done for me my dear peter god bless you you are one of the very few whom i always loved god bless you my boy and never forget that all i have is at your command if you come my way i thanked him and saluting the officers went down the side as i expected when i came on board the captain demanded in an angry tone why i had stayed so long i replied that i was shown down into count shuxon's cabin and he conversed so long that i could not get away sooner as it would not have been polite to have left him before he had finished his questions i then gave a very civil message and the captain said no more the very name of a great man always silenced him End of chapter 60 Recording by John Brandon